الله على أعدائهم أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس من يتخذ من دون الله أندادا يحبونهم كحب الله والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد وآل محمد we have been discussing the art of yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the basis of our discussion has been this verse of the Quran chapter 2 verse 165 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in amongst people there are some who take for themselves objects of worship besides God and they love them as they ought to have loved God whereas the believers they are intense in their love for Allah we have almost come to a conclusion now and inshallah tomorrow night we will uh, start discussing the conclusion um, if there is any bit left we will inshallah cover that on uh, Saturday night tonight we want to complete our discussion on what practical steps we can undertake in our lives so as to soften our hearts and remove the various forms of materialisms that creep in without our knowledge so that with this softening of the heart and this preparation of the heart we can experience uh, a yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or feel his love in our hearts so last night we uh, completed uh, discussing uh, how to recite du'as and we talked about salatul layl tonight we want to uh, move on to another uh, important aspect of softening the heart and that is the importance of uh, um, not eating excessively you will recall in terms of practical steps we used the verse of Quran chapter 2 verse 45 which says was ta'inu bis sabri was salat and seek help from Allah with patience and with prayers and we said patience in tafsir here refers to fasting so in terms of the harms of eating excessively, I will once again refer to the Misbah al-Shariah of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We used this reference on the very first night when we defined what yearning is about. Here's the sixth Imam alayhi salam when discussing eating. He says, there is nothing more harmful to the heart of a believer than having too much food. For it brings about two things. It hardens the heart and it causes an arousal of desires. And the Messenger of Allah, peace be on him and his family, said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, the son of Adam does not fill any worse vessel than his belly. And Dawood alayhi salam said, leaving a morsel of food that I need is preferable to me than staying up for 20 nights. So he's comparing that sometimes giving up food is 20 times more difficult than even worshipping Allah in the night. But at the same time its effect is that much more profound. What you can attain in terms of softening the heart sometimes with one day of fasting can be equal to what you would attain if you kept eating to your fill and stayed at night worshipping Allah for 20 nights and in another hadith also hadith al-Nabawi we are told a mu'min eats with one stomach whereas a munafiq eats with seven stomachs and what this means is that a munafiq eats seven times that of a mu'min and you will find also people who are more attached to this world they are obsessed about eating all the time in another actually hadith uh, uh, from Imam al-Sadiq regarding eating, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, man kana hammuhu batnuhu kana qeematuhu ma kharaja minhu. One whose constant concern is eating, his value is what comes out from him. In other words, his value is what he excretes because that is what he values, that is his constant preoccupation day and night. What can I eat? What can I eat? What else can I eat? And Isa alayhi salam says, the heart does not have any worse disease than hardness. And there is no soul that is more weakened than by the lack of hunger. So, 
eating is something that uh, you know we can talk about uh, for a whole session uh, and its harms. And it is wrong to judge another person. Of course, everyone knows their own um, capacity and their own limitation. But we are our best judge as to when am I eating out of hunger and when am I eating out of greed? And when am I full and when am I overeating? Again, if you go to a mujtahid and you're walking the fine line and asking about halal and haram, the only thing your mujtahid will tell you is if it's halal food, you can eat as much as you want. You have to come into the levels of iman and spirituality where then the question in Irfan, Ahsan, where it comes into the issue of saying it is makru to overeat. One common tendency people have is when there's a little bit left, it says, you know, this will go to waste, just finish it. So instead of using the garbage can, you use your stomach to uh, dispose of whatever is left. So we are full, we are no longer hungry, we don't want to eat, but because it will get thrown, so just finish it. And uh, there is also a hadith that says, do not make your stomachs a cemetery for animals. Because some people eat, not only overeat, but they want to eat meat as well. لا تجعلوا بطونكم مقابر للحيوان Do not make your stomach a maqbara for حيوان in a variety of animals, not just one. So, even though Islam strongly condemns waste and throwing away food, uh, if you have to choose between your stomach and the garbage can, uh, you know, leave your stomach. Because that is wrong, this is wrong, but this will affect your spirituality, this will affect your iman. And in this day and age with refrigerators and so on, there is usually no reason to throw the food. But there is also no reason to uh, overeat. So enough said on that subject, inshallah, and we are our own best judge. The other important aspect of seeking spirituality and trying to uh, soften the heart is solitude. And we have been mentioning this time and again that those who seek spirituality are usually torn between these two things, whereas on one hand they wish to be isolated so that they can spend some time alone in meditation and worship of Allah. And on the other hand, Islam does not allow them monasticism or to cut themselves away from society. So there is a delicate balance that they have to constantly juggle between the two. Islam does provide some means of relief such as, uh, you know, allowing you to perform i'tikaf in a mosque um, or encouraging you to pray Salatul Layl uh, in the middle of the night. But nonetheless, this is a constant challenge. The key important thing is that one should try and strive to reach a level where one does not need people to be happy, where one can find the more pleasure in being alone worshipping Allah than in being in uh, social gatherings and being surrounded by people. Most people cannot do that. Most people cannot stay alone at home. The moment they are alone, they'll phone someone, talk to someone, go out of the house. If they can't do that, switch on the television occupy themselves, but they can't sit alone, it bothers them, it depresses them. Uh, whereas what Islam, what we are talking about here is that uh, it is quite possible for a person to enjoy being alone if they learn to use, uh, uh, recognize Allah's presence as a company. Uh, so for example, in one uh, hadith which is in Uddat al-Da'i as well of Allah Mahilli, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the Prophet Musa and says, Ya Musa, Al-Faqir man laysa lahu mitli kafil. O Musa, poor is he who does not have me for a guardian. Wal-Marid man laysa lahu mitli tabib. And sick is he who does not have me for a physician. Wal-Gharib man laysa lahu mitli munis. And a stranger is truly he who does not have me for a companion. So there are levels of um, spirituality and at one point one realizes the truth of uh, this hadith. And those who have attained that level, they realize that truly if you have Allah, then you are in good hands and you have company. Whereas if you are estranged from Allah, then you are always a stranger even if you are surrounded by people. That is why, for example, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, she is one of those women who have been described as the four great women of paradise after the daughter of the Prophet and his wife uh, Khadija alayhi salam. We have Maryam, the wife, mother of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. 
Ati alayhi salam in the Quran, when she prays to Allah even for Jannah, she says, Rabbibni li indaka baytan fil Jannah. O oh Allah, build for me with you a house in paradise. This is a, this is a fine point here. Uh, Ayatollah Jawad Amuli in his tafsir uh, of Quran on this verse, he makes a point. He says, notice that she did not say first, give me a house in Jannah with you. She said, give me a house with you in Jannah. And he says, there is a big difference between Jannat in Tajri min tahtiha al-anhar. And in the Kabaitan fil Jannah. One is the ordinary Jannah beneath, beneath which rivers flow. This is a Jannah with Allah, meaning she valued the presence and the uh, intimate communication with Allah even more than the uh, Jannah. And in one dua from Amir al Mu'mineen uh, alayhi salam, he says, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, Allahumma innaka anisul anisin li awliya'ik. O Allah, you are the best of all companions. You are the most intimate of all companions for your friends. In awhashtahumul ghurba anasahum dhikrak. If they ever feel lonely, then they feel the pleasure of your company by remembering you. Wa in subbat alayhimul masaib laja'u ila al istijaratu bika. And if they are ever surrounded by afflictions, they come running to you for protection. So again, here the Imam is expressing uh, the same thing. And that is why, if you look at Nahjul Balagha, that famous khutbah of um, uh, the qualities of a mu'min that uh, the Imam talks to Himam uh, and, and, and explains to him, uh, you know, what are the qualities of a believer. At the end of that, we are told the Himam or Humam, he actually faints, he collapses and passes away because he cannot take it anymore, the way the Imam describes the qualities of a muttaqi, uh, of, of one who is pious. Uh, they have such an impact on him that it overwhelms him. He collapses and he passes away. And then later on the Imam talks about this, and at one point he says, if it was not for the fact that there is something like destiny where it is written for everyone when they will die. A believer's soul would not be able to stay in the body out of their shawq for Allah. Out of their yearning for Allah, the soul is like a caged bird. It flutters and, and, and uh, is restless within, wanting to leave the body and ascend towards the heaven in search of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the kind of uh, um, feeling we want to experience within ourselves. But unfortunately, this cannot be if our solace and our comfort comes from people. That is why we have one hadith from uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, كَيْفَ يَأْنِسُ بِاللَّهِ مَنْ لَا يَسْتَوْحِشُ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ How can one feel close to Allah when one has not yet learned to detach from the people? When we are still so dependent on our social company and social gatherings and mixing with people, that is still so important to us for our survival, how can we even start experiencing what it means to love Allah? In a similar hadith from Imam Hassan al-Askhari alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, he says, Alamatul uns billah al-wahshatu min al-nas. He says, the sign of a person having attained some relationship, some closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their detachment from people. You will recall on the first night as well, we said that those who yearn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will see that in their lives, they have friends, they have relatives, but they're not overly obsessed about any one particular relationship with creatures, because the, the relationship they value the most is their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are some of the uh, steps that uh, uh, you know, we can look at in terms of softening the heart. In summary, if you look at all this variety of, of traditions, you will see uh, there is a mix that is required to first prepare, that one needs to first look at one's life and simplify it a little bit, eat a little less, sleep a little less, uh, talk a little less, be less worldly in one's uh, way of life, and then uh, increase one's worship and one's dhikr of Allah to get that desired effect. And that is why we have one famous hadith that says, 
إذا أحب الله عبدا أهمه بالثلاثة When Allah loves a person He makes him concerned about three things قلة الطعام وقلة المنام وقلة الكلام Eating less, talking less and sleeping less So this is all and it, perhaps that is why it rhymes So it's easy to remember طعام, منام and كلام That when Allah loves a person You will begin to see these signs in him or her that they will naturally begin to lose interest in too much sleeping and too much eating. And, and these are the things that really hold our, ourselves, uh, our, holds us hostage in terms of our uh, desires. What I want to do to um, end, um, I'm not ending right away, but moving towards the end for tonight so that I can start on the conclusion tomorrow, inshallah, is... So far, all the pieces of advice that I have shared with you uh, have been my personal um, research, whatever little I could find from books. I have taken them from various sources and pieced them together and said to you that, you know, this can be done or that can be done. But in order to add to that and validate it further, I want to share some direct advice from other individuals so that we can see uh, that even though I took these different pieces from various sources, they ultimately are influenced by the Ahlul Bayt in the same way. And these are direct pieces of advice for people who want to uh, gain uh, higher levels of spirituality. So I'm going to uh, quote uh, first some advice from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq which is Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then I would like to quote some advice from two or three different maraja and, uh, and uh, mujtahideen, some famous uh, scholars in our uh, madhab, and see what they have to say about people who are trying to purify themselves and experience this yearning for Allah. So first from the sixth Imam alayhi salam, there are um, two or three different narrations. In the first narration, he talks about how to be more diligent when you say your prayers in order to attain more spirituality. He says, when you face the Qibla, you should despair of this world and what it contains of creation and what others are occupied with. Empty your heart of every preoccupation which might distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See the immensity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your innermost being and remember that you will one day stand before him. When you recite the takbir, that means that first takbiratul ihram, when you say Allahu Akbar, you should belittle whatever is in the high heavens and in the moist earth. That means forget the world and all it contains. The moment you say Allahu Akbar, forget everything else. Anything which is below his glory. For when Allah looks, this is from the sixth imam, he says when Allah looks into the heart of his slave who is saying takbir, and he sees in his or her heart something obstructing the truth in his declaring that Allah is the greatest. Then Allah says to the person who is praying, O oh liar, are you trying to deceive me? By my might and my majesty, I will deny you the sweetness of my remembrance, and I will veil you from my nearness and from the joy of my intimate communion. That means Allah should not find you standing before him and saying Allahu Akbar. What does Akbar mean? Akbar means greater or greatest. Akbar is actually the superlative of Kabir. So in the language of the ordinary people, Allahu Akbar means Allahu Akbar min kulli shay. Allah is greater than everything else. In the language of the Urafa, there is even a higher level than that. Because the Arif says, in reality, there is no reality except Allah. So how can anything be compared to Allah and be said to be, Allah is greater than everything else, when everything else is nothing before Him? So Allah is not Akbar min kulli shay. Allahu Akbar min an yusuf. Allah is greater than anyone's ability to describe Him. So they define Allahu Akbar differently. They say it's not Allah is greater than everything else. It's Allah is greater than anyone's capacity to define and describe Him. So when you do Allahu Akbar, Allah should not find in our heart even the slight attachment or feeling of something else being equally important or something that will compete for our attention with Allah. Because then He says to us, 
You are lying. Are you trying to deceive me? I will deny you the sweetness of my love if you do that. Know that Allah does not need your service. So then the Imam goes on to talk about how Allah is independent of you. He doesn't need you. It is you who needs him and he is doing you a favor by allowing you to stand before him and worship him. This is an excellent book uh, for those of you who, you know, uh, want, you should try and get a copy of this. It's in English and I don't think it's even more than $10, Lenten of the Path. It is believed to have been written by the sixth Imam himself. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's definitely the number one book you want to have if for people who want to um, uh, better themselves spiritually. Then there is another piece of advice from the sixth Imam alayhi salam concerning resting. How does a believer rest? We said the other day that a mu'min loves to exhaust himself in the service of Allah. He doesn't like too much comfort. The sixth Imam alayhi salam says, a believer only acquires true rest when he will meet Allah. Although he may rest by four different things. One, silence by which you recognize the state of your heart and yourself in your relationship to your Creator. Two, retreat by which you are rescued from the evils of the times, outwardly and inwardly. Three, hunger which kills fleshy appetites and temptation. And four, wakefulness which illuminates your heart and purifies your nature and cleans your spirit. So you can see now that the uh, advice coming from the uh, sixth Imam salam, is also in a very similar uh, vein to what we have been discussing, that wakefulness and hunger and uh, some degree of uh, seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, silence as well are all important factors. Uh, one last piece of advice again from the sixth Imam alayhi salam. This comes actually from uh, a man called Unwan Basari, and this is another very good book. I'm using English books on purpose because I know there are many here who are not familiar with Arabic. This book is Self-Building by Ayatollah Amini, and uh, there is in fact a copy right here for those who want to take a look at it even later on. Uh, there is a whole section on different ed pieces of advice and instruction. This man, Unwan Basari, he's a 94-year-old man, and he's struggling to make himself spiritually better. So he comes to speak to the sixth Imam alayhi salam and asks him for some advice. And it's a lengthy tradition, but I'll jump to the pieces that I want to quote here. At one point, the sixth Imam alayhi salam refers to this Unwan Basari, and he calls him Abu Abdullah. Uh, he says to him, O oh Abu Abdullah, Knowledge cannot be acquired by learning, rather real knowledge is light which illuminates a person's heart who is blessed with Allah's guidance. Therefore, if you are the seeker of knowledge, first make your heart comprehend the reality of what it is to be Allah's servant. And then request for knowledge by means of your deeds. In other words, act on the little that you know and Allah will give you more. And ask Allah for comprehension so that you can understand. So this Unwan uh, al-Basari asks the Imam, what does it mean to be a true servant of Allah? And the Imam says, true, to be a true servant of Allah lies in three things. The first thing is that you should not consider yourself to be the owner of anything you possess. The second thing is that you should consider yourself to be absolutely helpless in managing your own affairs. And the third is that you should constantly engage yourself in obeying Allah and keep away from disobeying Him. And the reason for these three things the Imam explains is that if a person does not consider anything he or she possesses to be his own or her own, if you don't consider yourself to be the owner of your wealth, if you don't consider the property that you own to be yours, then you will spend, then spending it in the way of Allah will be easier for you. Because you realize, it's not mine, I'm just a keeper for it, I'm just a trustee for it. And if a person feels helpless in managing their own affair, then they will trust Allah to manage their affairs. And then they will find it easier to tolerate the hardships of this world. And if a person constantly engages in good and keeps away from sins, then their precious free time will not be wasted in nonsense amusements. That is another very important thing. They say, if you want to know the value of a person, if you want to know an individual, what is his worth? 
The simplest way to find out the worth of a person is find out what does the person do with their free time. Because everybody eats, everybody sleeps, everybody has to go to work, everybody has to go to school, everybody has to go grocery shopping, everybody comes to the mosque and prays. These are things we all do. Then there is some free time, there is some time that we have of our own. You can tell the value of a person when you know what does this person do with his free time. That will tell you whether that person has any goals in life, whether that person is more inclined to the hereafter or this world, whether that person is enslaved by his or her desires. What is it that obsesses us? What is it that we yearn to do when we are free and on our own? Then the sixth Imam alayhi salam gives other pieces of advice to Unwan al-Basari. For example, he tells him, do not eat anything unless you are hungry. Do not eat anything in particular unless you feel an appetite for it. When you eat something, always make sure you are taking the name of Allah and what you are eating is halal. If someone says to you, if you say something to me, I will say ten sentences to you. You say to him, if you say ten sentences to me, I will not even say one sentence to you. In other words, the Imam is teaching us how to control our anger. Then he says to him, if someone threatens you with an abusive language, you be polite and try and advise him. If someone accuses you falsely of something you haven't done, then say to him, if what you say is true, may Allah forgive me. And if what you say is wrong, may Allah forgive you. So the Imam teaches him all these things. When you don't know something, ask those who are more learned than you. But do not ask them questions with the intention of examining them and trying to test their knowledge. Avoid issuing your own fatwas and religious decrees. Because by doing that, you are offering your neck as a bridge for people to cross. This is very important. That's why I told you the other day when people ask me questions like, why is music haram and why is this and why is that? I tell them, go ask your mujtahid. Because sometimes people know the answer. But the reason they ask you is because they want you to validate it for them and tell them it's okay, Allah will forgive you. Don't ever fall into that trap. The simple answer is, I will not let you use my neck as a bridge so that you cross into paradise and I fall into the fire of hell. Now, keeping in mind the limited time we have, there is some advice from Allama Majlisi. Allama Majlisi is the compiler of Biharul Anwar, one of our greatest uh, works, and we have a lot of other works from him. We are indebted to him, undoubtedly. He also attained high levels of ma'rifah. And again, I would advise you to go and read this in, in this book, but um, uh, here he talks about uh, a spiritual experience he had where he says one night he was half asleep, half awake, and he saw... Uh, the messenger of Allah, peace be on him and his family, in a, in a dream. And he said, this was an opportunity for me to look at him closely. And I thought, let me look at the Prophet closely and see, you know, uh, how perfect he is in every way. And he says, the more I looked at him, the more there was this nur that expanded and filled the room. And he says, it made me realize, he said, I had a sudden realization that in fact the Qur'an is nothing but a manifestation of the akhlaq of the Prophet. And he says, the more attention I paid to the Prophet, the more I could understand the Qur'an. And he says, even after I had this dream, I found that now whenever I reflect on verses of the Qur'an, I had this deep understanding from a place I never imagined. And, and um, you know, he explains it very beautifully here. And he says, of course, this incident cannot be appreciated by many people, but my aim is to advise my fellow believers. So he then gives some advice and says how you can attain, uh, you know, that level of spirituality. And again, he advises, he says, avoid useless talk, avoid living a luxurious life, eating too much, uh, spending too much on your food and your clothes. Avoid too much social mixing and social gatherings where the talk is just worldly and, uh, uh, you know, um, sinful or even if it's not sinful, he says, avoid any talk where Allah's remembrance is not included. Try to keep the company of people who are closer to Allah so they constantly remind you of Allah. And then he says that some people have said that if you constantly recite, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, it is very helpful in your spiritual development. Allama Majlisi says, I myself have found just saying Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu frequently has greatly helped me uh, increase in my 
spirituality. He says, if this is done for a period of 40 days, day and night continuously, then certainly the doors of wisdom and learning and love will be open to the person and enable him to ascend to the most exalted Gnostic positions. So that is his experience. Uh, and then there is, um, again, very quickly, I apologize for taking another 5-10 minutes, but I want to complete this subject tonight. Uh, Mullah Hussain Quli Hamadani, another famous uh, scholar, he talks about the importance of staying in the state of wudu at all times uh, and avoid attending meetings and gatherings where there is a possibility of sins being committed, even if the socialization is not sinful, but it's of people who are negligent uh, about the hereafter. Too much humor, too much nonsense talking, uh, all injures your heart. Uh, he talks about the importance of staying up on Thursday nights and reciting Surah Al-Qadr a hundred times between Thursday night and Friday afternoon. I want to end with some advice from Ayatollah Mirza Jawad Agha uh, Maliki Tabrizi. Ayatollah Jawad Maliki Tabrizi was a very well-known uh, Arif, and uh, if you speak to any student from Qum, they will speak of him in very high words, and he didn't pass away too long ago, but his books are very well-known. They're all Irfani. Uh, there is another book of his that I will use, inshallah, tomorrow and day after, called Suluk al-Arifan, uh, in which he talks particularly about uh, spiritual uh, struggling in the month of Ramadan. And it's available in English as well. Um, it's called Spiritual Journey, Journey of the Mystics in the Month of Ramadan, or something like that. Um, and he, his advice is that when you perform sajda, prolong your sajda as much as you can, uh, not in your salat only, but even your mustahab, your last sajda of shukr, or whenever you get a chance to do sajda, make sure it is as long as possible. And uh, uh, he says that Imam Sajjad salam used to recite uh, 1,000 times in sajda, La ilaha illallahu haqqan haqqa, la ilaha illallahu ta'abudan wa riqqa, la ilaha illallahu imanan wa sidqa that there is no God but Allah truly and justly. There is no God but Allah, and I bow in humility before Him. There is no God but Allah and the truth, indeed, and this is the truth and my faith. And then he says that uh, when he was staying in Najaf al-Ashraf, he once asked uh, a marja taqlid who was very pious, uh, that give me some advice that will help me make myself better spiritually. And he says the marja said to him that, Try and prolong your sajda, and in the sajda try and say, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min zalimin There is no God but you. Glory be to you. Surely I have been of the unjust ones. And he says, when you do this, try and focus your attention on the fact that it is not Allah who has been unfair to me, but rather I have been unfair to myself. I have injured and hurt myself. And he says, there were students of this marja who would do this, 1,000 times in sajda, and there were some who would do it 3,000 times. But this is known to be a, a, a cure or something that has really helped uh, people uh, attain high levels of uh, spirituality. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. This is the dua of the Prophet Yunus alayhi salam when he was in the belly of the uh, fish. So uh, we stop here uh, for tonight, and inshallah we will uh, continue with the conclusion tomorrow. Uh, in light of the fact that this is Thursday night, I would just like to recite a few words of Masaib because it is highly recommended that we remember Aba Abdullah al Hussein on a night like this. If you can please recite aloud Sawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad wa Muhammad Muhammad. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is very special to those who seek spirituality and those who struggle to better themselves spiritually based on his du'as, based on his lifestyle, based on and this is true for all Imams, but from Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there are some words that he said in Karbala that really uh, are, are, are uh, moving and of a very high uh, importance to the Urafa. There was one great Arif, Ibn, uh, Ibn Tawus, I believe, uh, who compiled one of the early books of Du'as from which Sheikh Abbas Kumi compiled Mafatul Jinan and so on. He says in one of his books, he says that Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura, he attained his uruj, he reached levels of spirituality that human beings can never imagine. And he says the levels that Hussein reached on the day of Ashura were so lofty that if it was not for the fact that from a human perspective it was a calamity and a tragedy, 
He says, on the day of Ashura, we would dress as if it is Eid, in celebration of the levels that Hussein reached on the day of Ashura. This is the level of Aba Abdullah in the other world. And the more we struggle, the more Allah will test us. That testing has dual purposes. On one hand, it weans us off the world. On the other hand, it tests what we are made of and how far we can go. When you think about it, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, everything was against him on the day of Ashura. The people were against him. The weather was against him. His body in terms of hunger and thirst was against him. The emotional drain of having to separate from his family was against him. Losing his brother, losing his children, losing his companions, all that was against him. And yet he stood firm and did not waver even for a moment. A small example we see is how the moment when he is leaving for his final journey to the maktal and he has to reason with his four-year-old daughter, Sakina alayhi salam. And Sakina is insisting to her father that everyone who has gone has not come back. Why can't you stay with me? For a child to be attached like that, because we are told Sakina alayhi salam, when she used to sleep at night, she used to sleep on the chest of Hussein. And she wouldn't sleep unless she was with her father. So now Hussein alayhi salam is trying to explain to Sakina that my daughter, I have to go and die. The immensity of this moment, if we can just capture this, Miranis tries to capture this in a few verses that I want to share with you. He says that Sakina alayhi salam first says to her father, she says, Nind aayegi jab aap ki bu paungi baba, me raat ko maktal me chali aungi baba. I will only sleep, my dear father, when I can smell your fragrance, when you are near me. And if you have to go to the maktal, I will come running to you in the middle of the night. Hussein is still trying to console Sakina. Farmaya nikalti nahi saidaniya bahar, chati pe sulayigi tume raat ko madar. Oh Sakina, little girls do not come out into the desert in the middle of the night. You must sleep with your mother tonight. And Hussein is trying to explain this little girl. Usne kaha fir aaj kaha soenge asghar. Asghar sleeps with my mother. If I am to sleep with him, with my mother, where will Asghar sleep tonight? Sheh bole ke bas zid na karo sadke me tum par. Shab hoegi aur dasht me hum hoenge bibi. Asghar mere saath aaj wahan soenge bibi. Oh Sakina, you sleep with your mother tonight and Asghar will sleep with me in the plains of Karbala. This is Hussein. He left towards the battlefield calling out to Allah in his final moments he is praying to Allah and expressing his yearning for Allah. This is the dua of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein. Taraktul khalqa turran fi hawaak. O oh Allah, I have abandoned all creation out of my love for you. Wa aytamtul ayal likay araak. And I have accepted that my children should become orphans just so that I can come and see you. Walau qatta'ani fil hubbi irba lama hanna al-fu'ada siwaak. And if I was to be cut 